Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Weekend Wellness Hour show. Today we have a very interesting guest who knows a lot about eyesight and how to improve it naturally. So I met Nathan Oxenfeld on Clubhouse, a great new app for meeting people and connecting with people from all over the world. And we hit it off a couple of months ago and I actually was just featured on his podcast and just came out. So please check that out. It's called the Naked Eye Podcast. And Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Amy. Yeah, it's really cool how uh, we got connected and, and we're able to kind of um, relate to each other on, on some big topics here. And it's a really pleasure having you on my show and I was happy to release it just a couple of days ago so that uh, now people can check that out as well. Yeah, well, I'm very much an honor and I hope it helps all of your audience. Now today we wanna to talk about natural vision and I know you kind of went through a change in your own vision and can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this field, what happened to your own eyesight and let's get started there. Absolutely, yeah, it definitely all pretty much started just on a personal level because I got glasses when I was a little kid and kind of the typical story of like struggling to read the board in the front of the classroom. So. I got my first pair of prescription glasses to start wearing in elementary school. And then I switched over to contacts in middle school because I was kind of active and playing sports and the glasses were kind of annoying. And so I kind of was doing full-time contacts from like the moment I woke up in the morning until I went to sleep at night. Um, I wasn't one of those people who like slept in the contacts. I was, you know, kind of <laughs> trying to do my best, but still my prescription kept, you know, getting stronger and my vision was getting worse throughout high school and and it did sort of stabilize a little bit um but i just was really i, I didn't really like mind the glasses and the contacts they weren't bothering me a, a whole ton but i was a little bit worried just about the future in terms of like what what's my eyes if my vision's this bad in my teens in my early 20s how's it going to be you know when i'm 50 60 70 and getting older so I the only thing I knew about was laser eye surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, Oh, I'll just do that. I'll just get LASIK. And then I won't need the contacts or glasses anymore. And then I'm kind of fixed, yeah. but, but that wasn't really curing the issues. It was actually just sort of a fancier version of, you know, covering up the symptoms with, with a surgery. Mm -hmm. So um, I was really pleased that I was introduced to this thing called the Bates method um, in my final year of college. Um, I was mm -hmm. studying abroad in Iceland oh, nice. and it, it kind of came onto my doorstep at the right time because mm -hmm. I was just starting to get more into some other alternative approaches like yoga and meditation and, and breath work. And so I was like really excited about like making myself healthier through application of these modalities. And so then the Bates method showed up and it was sort of like this like missing link because like the yoga and the meditation and the breath work was helping everything, my whole body and my whole mind, but my vision was still blurry and I was still putting contacts in and wearing glasses. And so it was like this little missing link that it was like, oh, wow, this, this is what I was, you know, looking for in terms of addressing my eye issues. And so I pretty much just figured just give this a shot, see what happens. And, and sure enough, like by the end of that trip to Iceland, mm -hmm. um, my prescription had already dropped. So my myopia and my astigmatism had both improved slightly in just three months wow. of doing some of these simple little vision practices that we could maybe talk about today. Absolutely. Um, and, and also it was the first time in my life that I had spent extended periods with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. So that's a big reason why I called my show the naked eye podcast, because it's that's a part of how we rehabilitate the eyes naturally, is we take breaks from the prescription lenses. And we learn how to relax when we don't have the glasses and contacts in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, our vision begins to change and oftentimes for the better. Um, so yeah, that was, I was kind of hooked after that first three months of just like, whoa, there's, there's actually something to this. Like right. looking back my whole life, it was like, okay, I just expect the numbers to get higher and higher and mm -hmm. higher. My vision's going to get worse as I get older. But then I had this new experience where it's like, wait a minute, I'm getting older, but my vision's getting better. 
And so it was just this whole other avenue to explore. And I really just ran with it. And then over the next like three or four years, I kept working on it until mm -hmm. I got completely off my classes. Wow. Um, and I did get some help from a, a Bates mm -hmm. Method teacher in California named Dr. Mm -hmm. Jerry Ann Tabor. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had been already teaching the Bates Method since the 70s. And, and she'd already helped lots and lots of people with their vision. So I felt really good about working with her and, and getting some guidance and some coaching from a professional who had already improved her vision. And, and I feel like she kind of gave me that extra boost of confidence and accountability to really like go all the way to 2020 and then 2015 and then 2010 vision uh, without the help of glasses. So it's, it's been quite a, a journey on a personal level. And then like, like you insinuated, then I was like, well, I don't want to just keep this to myself. I, I kind of want to let other people know about this because there was yeah. kind of a big gap or a lack of awareness about these like simple natural alternatives. So that's, yeah. that's been my, my mission for the past eight years has really been um, um, just letting people know that this is an option. And if they want to look more into it and try it out, then there's people, there's teachers around the world who are, are devoted to helping people with their vision. Um, and I just didn't, I had no idea this existed. I didn't know there were people out there helping others with this stuff. So it's pretty exciting when you start to uh, look more into it. Yeah. And it's amazing when you start to look into something, then all of a sudden you find all these resources mm -hmm. and that law of attraction. And it's wonderful that now you've changed kind of your career and your path. And now you are sharing this with other people through your podcast. I know you have a book and a documentary out. So there's a lot of options out there for people to learn more about this. So we appreciate all your hard work on it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I just remember when I was like first researching this stuff and like looking online for like, what is the Bates method? How, what is it? How does it work? How do I learn it? And, and there was a fair amount. There were a lot of books out there on the material. I ordered a bunch of books and there were mm -hmm. some videos on YouTube and, but they're really just, I don't know when I, when I started actually teaching this stuff, that was like a really big goal of mine is I wanted to put out like high quality free content that actually teaches the, the actual Bates method because some of the videos that were on YouTube like 10 years ago when I was first looking into this were like it wasn't actually the Bates method it was actually okay. eye exercises okay so it's like okay look left look right look up look down that kind of stuff right and and that that is a good, it's, they're called the yogic eye movements. So it's actually okay. a practice from yoga, which has its own merits, mm -hmm. but that's not the Bates method. Okay. So, oh. so that was sort of one of, and it still is one of my kind of prerogatives is to really help people understand the, the difference between mm -hmm. what the Bates method teaches versus eye exercises. Um, Cause that might not actually yield the kind of improvements or results that we're talking about. Okay, so why don't we, why don't you tell us what is a Bates me method? So those of us who aren't familiar can mm -hmm. kind of get a, at least a mental grasp, overall grasp and kind of what you do with it. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably a, a good place to start because when I had blurry vision, like I said, I had myopia, which is nearsightedness. So I could see clear near, but not far. It was blurry mm -hmm. far away. And I also had astigmatism, which also creates a different type of kind of blur or, you know, uh, double vision with the, with the distance. And so my thinking, if I thought about another part of my body, I was like, oh, something's wrong with that part of my body. So it must mean that like that muscle is weak and I need to kind of strengthen it. Mm -hmm. So I thought my vision was blurry because my eye muscles weren't working right. They were too weak and I had to like exercise them because mm -hmm. um, that's what I thought about, you know, going to the gym or whatever. But the Bates method is quite the opposite. Um, it's called the Bates method. It's named after an eye doctor named Dr. William Bates, who lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And it's a system of relaxation. So the concept is not that your eye muscles are weak and you need to go take them to the gym and pump iron and start exercising them and <laughs> looking left and right and up and down. It's kind of the opposite. The idea is that the eye muscles are actually already too tight and too tense yep. and we need to actually teach them how to release and become more flexible as opposed yep. to being tight and rigid. Yes. 
And, and one manifestation of that, that most listeners probably can relate to is staring. Mm -hmm. So if you know you have a habit of staring, then that's an indication that your eye muscles are not loose and flexible. They're, they're, they've actually gotten really good at keeping your eye very still and kind of stuck, um, mm -hmm. which might be good for your productivity from your boss, you know, trying to get you to work more on the computer and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it, it might be not that great for your eye habits and eye health. So the Bates method, uh, Dr. Bates wrote a book called Perfect Sight Without Glasses. If you read that whole book, you, you'll never see him mention anything about eye exercises or you need to strengthen your eyeballs, any of that stuff. It actually has a lot more to do with mental relaxation mm -hmm. because our vision, if you think about it, actually isn't happening in our eye organs. It's happening in the visual cortex in the back right. of the brain. Mm -hmm. So you can spend all day, you know, strengthening your eyeballs, but if you're, if you're ignoring the whole mental process of perceiving the, the image, perceiving the light, we're really doing ourselves a disservice and we're not really working with like the neuroplasticity component here. So the Bates method involves ways that we can, yes, we do want to relax the physical eyes and the eye muscles, but one of the main ways we do that is through the mind. So things like mm -hmm. visualization um, and, and actually closing the eyes and picturing mental images and like I said, my issue with my eyes was I had poor vision in the distance. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would close my eyes mm -hmm. or even sometimes cover them up completely with my palms. It's called palming. Okay. okay. And I would actually visualize seeing clearly in the distance. So I had a dog, a little black poodle mix at the time mm -hmm. I was training my eyes. And so I would close my eyes. I would picture having a bright yellow tennis ball in my hand. I would throw the ball out to Carl and he would run out and get the ball. And if I was doing this with my eyes open without any glasses on, he would get blurry pretty quickly. And I, I wouldn't be able to see the details on Carl when he would go mm -hmm. off in the distance. It would only be when he came back up close. I could see the intricacies of his hair and his eyes and his nose and his tongue and everything. But with my eyes closed, I would imagine him not getting blurry, staying clear as he went out into the distance, getting smaller, right? Because as things go off in the distance, they appear to get smaller in size. Right. Because my mind, my myopic mind was not capable at first of picturing small details at far distances. Makes sense. Yeah, because of years and years and years of physically not seeing that. Right. And unless I have my glasses on. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of like, that's not an eye exercise, mm -mm. you know, picturing a dog running away and coming back with a tennis ball in its mouth. But that is a way that we can work with our inner vision. So like mm -hmm. the insight, the memory, the imagination, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things that kind of struck me as what really sets the Bates method apart from eye exercises. You know, there's mm -hmm. a whole chapter in Dr. Bates's book called memory as an aid to vision. And then the next one is called imagination as an aid to vision. Okay. When I first was looking at that, I was like, what does this have to do with my eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But, but yeah, there's this whole really, you know, interesting relationship between your eyesight, which is what you see outside of yourself and your insight, which is what you see when you close your eyes or when you dream at night, you have these dreams and these visions and we can actually work with that. And that's actually working with the visual cortex in the brain. Absolutely. And it goes along with the body is, it follows what our mind is setting it. You know, you hear about Dr. Joe Dispenza talking about your thoughts and your beliefs and your emotions kind of set your body into this type of life. I can see how vision can follow the same suit. Our brain is so powerful. Yeah. And if we have our brain focus on something, the brain chemistry changes, which will affect any of our functioning that's related to input from the brain. And it goes with same with the rest of our body. And I know that very acutely with teaching people that often our muscles are in a guarded state, that neuroprotective guarded state. So it comes to follow. Why not? Would that be possible with the eyes? And so I completely understand the Bates method 
saying things are wound up too tight. You have this neuromuscular tone that's guarding the muscles in a shortened position, not allowing them to relax into it's their full mu muscle length that allow us to see near, far, or whatever. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful point there because where, where you're kind of leading us is into thinking about the why. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Bates method asks, which I, I, I personally feel like the, that's one of the sort of flaws or the downfalls of the conventional approach to eye care is they're not really interested in why your vision is blurry in the first place. It's just yeah. like, okay, you're dealing with this blur. Here's some glasses or here's some contacts or here's a surgery, but it's mm -hmm. not like, well, let's ask some questions of why those muscles are behaving in that way and, and what is the root cause of that? And the, our, our eyesight is our primary sense that we interact with the world with and, and have experiences with. Every experience that we've you know, had has, you know, in one way or another, it's, it's passed through the eye organs. Everything you've seen and you know, it, it, the, or, these are the gateways. You know, it, the light enters the body through the eyes. And if you see something that's disturbing, scary, frightening, uh, you know, trauma inducing, that creates that protection. I love that what you said, it's this protection, this defense mechanism of, ooh, I don't like that, or I don't wanna see more of that. So I'm gonna kind of, you know, unconsciously or subconsciously um, protect myself from that in the future. Yeah, And absolutely. we can actually blur things out to feel safer. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I really think that that was a big part of why my vision started going downhill at, you know, in the single digits you know, that was one thing that my vision teacher helped me with was like, okay, you got glasses around seven or eight years old. What was going on when you were five and six and seven that led up to that? And it was really enlightening to really make those connections. And because I had never done that before. I was just like, oh, this is just normal. Everybody gets glasses. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so when I really started to tie the story together and, and make those more emotional connections, um, it, yeah, I learned a lot about the why. And, and I think it's a powerful little meditation people can do or a journal entry is just like, take some time to just like, reflect and investigate and, and think about, it's usually not like, exactly when you got the glasses, you, you might want to actually go back six months to even like two years beforehand, because it kind of is a gradual thing that can happen. Yeah, and I love that you're bringing this up, because so much of how our body state is, we blame it on genetics and we blame it on, well, this is the way it's going to be. We've set something in motion and we even blame it on environmental incidents that happen in terms of, oh, maybe I looked at the sun too many times or something that has happened in our past. I see this with injuries all the time. Oh, I hurt my knee 20 years ago. And that's why there's pain today. And we don't realize that incident may have started something, but the incident itself and the trauma and the damage that the physical part of that may have healed, but it's the neuroprotective response after that, that determines what happens years down the line, just kind of like what you're saying. And I love that you're saying, look at your history, look at why there may have been a change in your eyesight. What are some of the other factors that may have contributed to what your eyesight is today? And now, can we unwind that? Is there a strategy or approach or multiple approaches that we can go through to unwind that? So I really appreciate you saying that. Yeah, the, the little um, kind of saying that's coming to me right now is, you know, sometimes you have to kind of clear your past in order to clear your present or clear your future. Yeah. Right? Because when I learned about the Bates method and it was like, hey, you can improve your vision naturally that was like, oh, that'd be really nice to have clear vision in the present moment and for mm -hmm. the rest of my life in the future. But it really prompted me to realize that there was something, there were things from my past that I wasn't looking at, I wasn't comfortable with, I kind of blurred, I kind of blurred over it. Mm -hmm. And so by, go, you know, spending a little bit of time going back and actually clearing that stuff and, and actually owning my vision history and my vision story, um, yeah, it really did translate into like a more sense of a, a clear seeing and a clear experience in the present, even though it was, you know, decades ago that, that we're talking about. So yeah, yeah it's, um, 
you know, once again, th this is how we, we come into the vision improvement world and we, we start maybe on the surface and on the physical level, it's like, oh yeah, I've got eye strain, I've got blurry vision. Uh, maybe I can learn some practices or some techniques to actually release that and feel better. But then it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and you realize, oh wow, it has to do with my mental vision, my visual cortex. Oh, it has to do with my heart and my emotions. And like, it's like, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> That's great. So, okay. So you've mentioned the Bates method, the emotional component. What are some other common kind of ideas we need to think about or strategies that can improve our, our vision? Yeah. So we, I've mentioned a couple um, like vision practices, like the palming and, and doing some of the visualization stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I also want people to really think about is their vision habits, okay. which is how we use our eyes from the moment we open them in the morning to the moment we close them to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we get a little stuck on, okay, well, what practices do I do? How do I fill these 15 minutes and, and take care of my eyes? And that's good. We want to start to get a little bit of, root, of a routine with that. Like we brush and floss our teeth to maintain our oral hygiene. So then we start to do some palming and some swinging and different Bates practices that maintain our visual hygiene. Okay. But what about the other 23 hours of the day? Right. So like right now, when you and I are, are on the computer having a conversation, we have opportunities to be either doing bad vision habits mm -hmm. or good vision habits. Okay. That's one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Bates. He said that there are as many hours in the day to use your eyes incorrectly as there are to use them correctly. Okay. So he wasn't, once again, he wasn't putting forth this exercise routine of, okay, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, whatever. He said, when you're reading, writing, talking, driving, any cooking, cleaning, anything that involves having your eyes open can become an opportunity to do the right thing. And the right thing usually means relaxing, blinking, mm -hmm. shifting. Okay. And central fixation, which we can definitely yeah. touch on a little bit because it's um, the fundamental principle of the Bates method. Okay. But maybe though that list isn't as familiar to people, um, mm -hmm. maybe the bad vision habit list is more in line <laughs> with your day. So the bad vision habits when you're on the computer or just going through your daily activities would be things like squinting or straining or staring, okay. um, which screens really promote. They do. Screens yeah. make it a little more difficult to, to take good care of our eyes. We get kind of sucked into the screen. We start staring. We lose our blinking. Um, you know, our eyes get dried out. They get strained. So... I think it'd be awesome if people left this conversation the rest of their day today or the rest of the week, they, they're just, they're not doing any eye exercises, but they're just going through their day like they normally would with a little bit extra awareness of how do my eyes feel right now? Mm -hmm. And is there any little tiny thing I can do to make them feel a little bit better? Maybe I can look out the window and blink for a few seconds and then come back to the screen. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll give myself permission to just close my eyes for a breath or just count to five or 10 mm -hmm. and then open back up. It's like a little visual reset. Right. But, but these are little tiny things that get completely skipped over because we've got to get that project done or we've got to meet that deadline or it's just easy to forget. Yeah. And by shifting, do you mean shifting your eyes side to side or is there another meaning to that? Yes. So there's two dimensional shifting and there's three dimensional shifting. Okay. So two dimensional shifting would be like, um, you know, I've got a picture of Dr. Bates behind me on the wall and also a picture of Swami Sachi Dananda. It's kind of hard to see because of the, the glare from the windows. Right. But if you were to kind of switch between Bates and Sachi Dananda back and forth, that would be more of a two dimensional shift of okay. just letting your eyes kind of explore or like going around on an eye chart. You're looking at the different letters or reading a book. These are examples of 2D shifting, just going on, on the same plane. Um, but I think what's more important on the screen time and any of our near activities really is the 3D shifting. So I've got a couple things on my wall with different mm -hmm. shapes and colors, uh, mm -hmm. a, 
behind my computer screen so that I'm not just staring at the camera the whole time. I'll look up at the colors and the shapes. I've also got two windows on either side of my monitor. So I'll look out this window and that window. So I'm mm -hmm. shifting from the near point to the far point and then back. Okay. And your eyes love that. They desire that, they crave that, and they depend on that to be flexible and feeling good. Mm -hmm. They hate it when you keep them focused at the same distance for too long. That's just so unnatural to their normal functioning. Right. Especially right. when you're looking at a flat two-dimensional surface like a screen or a book. Mm -hmm. um, I really feel like the eyes prefer to look at three-dimensional objects, things with depth. Um, so yeah, the shifting is, is if you can kind of um, in your mind sort of put that as a polar opposite to staring, because staring yeah. is just a complete lack of, of movement. You know, the eyes are just kind of stuck. Right. Um, right. So, and you, you mentioned also something about central. Yeah, central fixation. Fixation, okay. Um, this is one of the more kind of subtle aspects or some of the, one of the more kind of trickier, confusing pieces. Um, but it's really important. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're going to take a moment to just kind of touch on it because this, in my opinion, is really like one of the main reasons why people lose the clear vision in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the best ways to get it back. Okay. And it has to do with how you're focusing or how you're looking at the world. Mm -hmm. um, it really is just a reflection of the anatomy of your eye. So your retina inside of your eye. Mm -hmm. I remember in elementary school, I learned about how I had rods and cones. That was like what made up the inside of my eye. But I didn't know what they were or how mm -hmm. they worked or where they were located. So the Bates method taught me that all the cones are packed into the, into the central area of your retina, like the bullseye on a dartboard. Mm -hmm. And the whole rest of your retina is primarily rods. Okay. And these are two different types of light receiving cells. They're mm -hmm. nerve cells and they can actually, um, they give us our vision. You know, light strikes the rods and the cones. It mm -hmm. transduces into a chemical signal, gets sent through the optic nerves to the visual cortex it, and flips the image upside down because the, the eye flips yep. the optics upside down. It's a pretty awe-inspiring process. Yeah. But what's important here is that your cones and rods operate differently. Your rods give you your peripheral vision mm -hmm. and they cannot handle colors or details like the cones can. The, the job of your peripheral vision is actually to sense motion and contrast. Okay. And, and people can try it. If, if you actually are looking at something with your central vision, like a screen or some object, if you like wiggle your fingers around in the periphery, mm -hmm. your rods are, they're sensing the movement of the fingers, but you're not sensing the details of the fingers out in the periphery. Mm -hmm. It's only when you bring it into the central and you get the cones to land on that object that you have capacity for colors and sharper details. And it's actually a pretty small area. So central fixation is your ability to kind of be aware that there's this difference between what you're looking directly at with your cones and your central vision relative to what your rods are experiencing in the periphery. Got it. Where when I wore glasses and contacts, I was not aware of that. It, it did this thing called diffusion where okay it made my central vision and my peripheral vision appear to be kind of the same. So like right now on the zoom window, I've got your face on the left, my face on the right. Mm -hmm. If I was wearing artificial lenses and looking at your face, um, I would probably still get some details and, and some sharp, you know, uh, focus on my face and maybe even on the chart. But with central fixation in this natural type of seeing and natural clarity, I look at you and I see the details on your face and I notice that there's less details on my face and I'm not really trying to read what the, the chart says. If I want to see what the chart says, I need to move my central vision over to the chart and now I can't see as many details on your face. That makes sense. It's kind of like in photography, um, mm -hmm. you know, on our phones, the portrait mode, or if yeah. you're really into photography of bokeh, which is, you know, the, the outside blur when you're focusing on, let's say in a 
person's portrait, you want the other aspects to be slightly blurred. So you're focus on what you really want to focus. So, so this is a skill that we want to try to hone in on, right? The central fixation. We want to enhance this skill, correct? Yes. And at first it sounds kind of counterintuitive because it's like, when I learned about natural vision improvement, I was like, cool, I'm going to improve my vision, which is my central vision and my peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. And it's all, and I was expecting my natural vision to eventually look like my glasses and my contacts vision. Okay. But that was one thing that my vision teacher, I'm so glad she really kind of diverted me down a different path. Cause she's like, no, that's not the right way to see. <laughs> that's very yeah. unnatural. We want to do it more like how you described in the photography terms of like a more shallow depth of field where, mm -hmm. you know, that's, you know, you look at a picture with the wide depth of field where everything's equally in focus near, far, left, right, top, bottom. That's nice for like landscapes and big, you know, but, but it's not how the human eye actually sees. Mm -hmm. And, and when you look at a picture that's taken in the portrait mode on the iPhone or like the, the shallow depth of field, we're, we're moved by that. We're like, wow, that's so beautiful. That's so, you know, it, it's more in line with how our human visual system operates. Mm -hmm. But um, our attempt to try and see everything all equally clearly is actually the biggest mistake we can make with our eyes. And if we let go of that and we stop trying so hard to make our entire visual field perfectly crisp and clear, that's actually what leads to better vision in the middle okay so like wow. what what you said about the the uh the blur around the edges mm -hmm. in the pictures i just want people to think of contrast this is how your brain it operates by contrast in order for the computer screen to be in the highest level of acuity and sharpness and focus the brain has to blur out the other things that you're not looking at we can't have it all, you know, it's, right. it's gotta be, you know, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? And a lot of people's nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, lots of other vision issues stem out of the impossible attempt to try and make your peripheral vision as clear and colorful as your central vision is. It's kind of a futile attempt and it leads to strain and blur. So if we can let go of that, and allow a smaller area of our vision to be clear and colorful. Sounds kind of counterintuitive, but um, I, I would invite people to play around with that and see what happens. Well, it makes sense. I mean, we hear the term multitasking. We never truly multitask. We never can truly do more than one thing at the same time. If you get down to the actual true meaning of it, and when you look at what you're truly doing, you're dispersing yourself and you're basically trying to do two things at once, but you're really only doing one thing and the other thing's kind of on the side and you're just diverting the tension back and forth quickly. So mm -hmm. I could see how, if you apply this to vision, you could imp really improve your vision by letting yourself focus on the one thing in front of it that you wanna see the clarity and detail in. Yeah, and, and just to tie this in with the shifting, like you asked about, mm -hmm. um, when you apply this central fixation concept mm -hmm. to your vision, it actually leads to more shifting automatically. Because when okay. I first learned, oh, I have to move my eyes more and shift my eyes more, I was a little like, I don't know, that sounds like like a lot of work and it's going to be exhausting if I'm just like constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. But if you think about this instead, if you're like spreading your focus out to encompass an entire eye chart as one whole object, mm -hmm. you're probably going to stare at it because it's just like, there's the eye chart. But if you shrink your central focus down to the size of one letter, or maybe even smaller than one letter, you land on that one letter and you're like, okay, that's not a whole eye chart, that's one letter. Then the rest of the letters are in your periphery and part of your mind is like, huh, what's that over there? And it prompts you to move your central vision to the other letter, the other letter, the other part, the other part, and all of a sudden, your eyes become alive and exploratory and curious and, and mobile and flexible as opposed to that kind of spreading out diffusion thing. And then you're just kind of like absorbing it all as one image. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of like the uh, connect the dots drawings where you right. kind of want to keep shifting from one point to another. 
uh, but in a relaxed way, right? That, that's always the key. We got to come back. We can't force this stuff or feel like, yeah, I'm exercising and doing the shifting. It's like, we want to let it start to happen a little bit more effortlessly and automatically. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, also one other topic I wanted to cover related to uh, vision is nutrition and diet. Cause we know we need certain nutrients to supplement and provide, you know, nourishment to our eyes. So what are some of the common little tips that you would say for nutrition and diet? Yeah, I think that's a big component. I really look at the whole diet nutrition supplementation as one of the kind of vision maintenance pieces. Mm -hmm. I look at the Bates method stuff as like the vision improvement stuff. That's actually going to lead to like better visual acuity and better functioning okay. and the and then making sure that the all the parts of the eyes, the retinas, the lenses, the optic nerves are getting fed the right type and the right amount of nutrients and vitamins and minerals. And also that we're um, limiting the things that we know don't make them very happy, like refined sugars. Got it. That's probably like the, the big bad, you know, no, no for the eyes in okay. particular because the eyes have these really teeny tiny little capillaries. And um, I remember in my yoga teacher training, um, one of the uh, people on the staff there were giving us sort of a talk about the whole yogic diet uh, component. And this, I'll never forget this, she kind of described um, those refined sugars as like little tiny shards of glass that get into your bloodstream and they'll kind of like slice up the inside of the blood vessel, these little micro abrasions that leads to inflammation. And, and I was like, Ooh, you know, cause I, I grew up like drinking a lot of Coca-Cola and eating a bunch of candy and stuff. And I was like, huh, maybe I'll stop like drinking glass. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great choice. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, both like limiting the stuff that we know is bad for the eyes and then mm -hmm. maybe increasing the things that we know are good. Um, so the, the number one thing on the list that, that isn't, uh, for the eyes is definitely going to be the dark leafy greens okay. because of their concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin. Mm -hmm. Those are probably like the two most, um, well-known or kind of common like eye nutrients okay. in a lot of your, um, supplements you'll take or eye vitamins, they'll have the lutein and the zeaxanthin in it. And they're, they're these, um, pigments and carotenoids that absorb into the retina. And the cool thing about zeaxanthin is that it, um, we're hearing a lot more about this whole blue light thing about how blue light maybe is messing with our circadian rhythms and our mm -hmm. melatonin production and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but also we're learning more about maybe the retinal health. And so if you have enough zeaxanthin in your system, in your retina, it acts as a blue light absorber Okay. So even if you're outside or, or you're on the computer working and you're getting that blue light exposure, um, the zeaxanthin is kind of negating that or neutralizing that in a sense. Right. Okay. So yeah, lot, lots of the salads with the dark leafy greens. Um, a lot of the berries are really good. They've got some really um, important nutrients and, and vitamins for the eyes. So I like to eat a lot of blueberries and um, some of those bilberry supplements are kind of popular for like mm -hmm. night vision and stuff like okay. that. Um, I'm a big fan of getting the vitamins and nutrients from the food and the diet versus the supplements, but I do also from time to time supplement with some, you know, high quality eye vitamins or nutrients. Okay. Um, so That's great. yeah, it's, it's, I'm not a dietitian and it's not really my full specialty, but I, mm -hmm. I have looked into it a lot for my, myself personally. And, um, I've looked into it a lot for some of my students who are dealing with things like cataracts um, and diabetic retinopathy and these certain things that can definitely have, you know, be kind of traced back to some dietary component. Um, so I think it's an important topic to really explore and, and just, you know, get a sense of those little changes you could be making. Um, but I mean, th there's so, there's so many ways we could go with it. There's herbalism, there's homeopathy, mm -hmm. there's Ayurveda. I mean, it's just like yeah. people have been figuring out ways to care for the eyes for thousands of years. And uh, so there's, there's a lot out there that we can really explore on this. 
That's amazing. So now if people are at home, they're thinking, okay, is this for me? What does that look like for you? What types of cases, type of people that you can help with this type of training? Yeah, that's a good question because I, I do have a pretty open mind about the fact that this could really benefit most people. Okay. Um, but it, I also do recognize that it does also kind of take a special kind of person to really like go all the way with this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, well, to, to answer the question, this the Bates method is for any vision problem. Um, most people use it for refractive errors, like mm -hmm. blurry vision near or far or astigmatism. Uh, but I, you know, when I first started this, this vision practice and, and putting videos out on YouTube and, and reaching out to people in the community and saying, Hey, I'm open for business. If you want to come, you know, learn how to take care of your eyes. I was kind of expecting just, you know, some basic, you know, a little bit of blur, you know, some reading glasses, but people came out of the woodwork with the most complicated vision issues that they've already been through the ringer with their eye doctor yeah. and they've left been left with no solutions and answers. And it's like, there's nothing we can do that's irreversible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was a little intimidated at first because it's like, well, is this really going to work for, you know, wet macular degeneration or glaucoma mm -hmm. or, you know, these other things. And, and sure enough, it's like, remember what we talked about earlier. It's, it's relaxation. That's yep. all it is. We're learning how to relax. Yes. <laughs> and, and I actually got a comment under one of my YouTube videos this week is like, is there any danger in practicing the Bates method? Because unfortunately, there's a very negatively biased Wikipedia mm. page about the Bates method that says okay. it's potentially dangerous. Oh, wow. And so my, my response was like, do you think there's any danger in relaxation? <laughs> you yeah. know, so it, it's, there, there is some controversy around it. And, and okay. the type of person I think that would really benefit from this is the kind of person who is, you know, open to alternatives. Um, maybe someone who's already kind of implementing some, you know, lifestyle change, whether it's yoga or breath work or diet, you know, exercise, whatever. But really it's somebody who, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to a word you said earlier, which mm -hmm. is, um, beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I work with people who believe that they can better themselves in their eyesight. Yep. Um, my mission isn't necessarily to convince people or to change people's beliefs. If they don't believe it's possible, that's okay. That's their choice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw, I kind of look at Dr. Bates as kind of like the martyr <laughs> because he devoted his whole life and his career to trying to actually change the status quo. I mean, he was an ophthalmologist. He spoke in front of the New York Medical Board and, and was trying to get other ophthalmologists on board with this less invasive, more natural approach. Mm -hmm. um, but he was ostracized. He, you know, he died without seeing that dream, you know, become a reality. Mm -hmm. And so I just realized like that, maybe that's not what I should do. Maybe I should focus more on the people who are already on board with, you know, making these changes. So if you've got discipline, if you've got patience, and if you've got a little bit of curiosity and, and playfulness, I think that um, there's a lot that can that you'll actually see happening when you start to, to take this on. That's great. And another question that people will come to in their mind is, does it matter what age you are? Yeah, it's another really great question because that um, some of these vision problems actually have that word in the name. Mm -hmm like yes. age-related macular degeneration or age-related farsightedness. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you hit 40 or 45 and everybody needs reading glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm really here to kind of, you know, push back on that a little bit and challenge that, that yes, I do believe that age has a, a factor on our eye health and our vision. Um, but what I love about the Bates approach is it's a more functional approach versus like just mm -hmm. age or genes. Mm -hmm. And so it, in my opinion, it is never too late to start taking better care of your eyes. And it's amazing how, even if you've worn glasses for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, how fast your eyes will respond to this work because it's like they're being held imprisoned behind these, you know, visual crutches and they're just like dying to get out. And you finally take the glasses off or the contacts off and they're like, yes, let's do this. And like, they, 
you know, start to become more flexible. But like another comment I read under a YouTube video was like, you know, I'm, I'm turning 76 this month and I'm just starting this and I'm already seeing improvements. That's um, you know, I, one of my oldest students, she's in her nineties and she started to be able to read her magazines and her newspapers without her reading glasses. Wow. She didn't start practicing until she was 86. Oh my gosh. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. That's so neat. it's, um, you know, it, it's the reason. Yeah. I think that the one, one thing that I felt like when I was going through this process was it almost felt like I was going back in time or like I was kind of reconnecting with some younger version of myself, like either before I got glasses or like just earlier in my life, it's this kind of interesting way to kind of tap into this like youthfulness and vitality. Um, when we start to play with the eyes and the vision, it's, uh, and actually I was in a session yesterday with a student who we were doing some of these visualizations, like I was talking about with the dog and the ball and stuff. Uh, we were doing some of the Bates visualizations and she uh, was reminded of this memory she hadn't thought of in, you know, probably half a century. It's like she used to be a, a swimmer and a diver and she was really uh, having fun jumping off the one meter diving board. But then the next one was a three meter diving board and she could remember this feeling of like getting up there and be like, uh, I don't know, it's a little, yeah. a little scary up here. And when we were doing this visualization, she got that same exact feeling that she got up on the diving board, like years and years and years ago that she hadn't felt since then. And it's like, that's the kind of thing. And, and she started laughing and kind of giggling. She's like, whoa, like I haven't really felt this way in a long time. And, and like these little mental things can like unlock little memories and uh, things from the past. It's just endlessly interesting to me. <laughs> That's so fascinating. So now you've also you've read a, written a book and a documentary. Can you touch base on those a little bit and then share how people can reach you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, it's, um, I've got my book right here. Actually, it's, I'm a fan of alliteration. So I called it give up your glasses for good. <laughs> and it's the holistic eye care for the 21st century. Because like I said, Dr. Bates um, put out his book in 1920. Mm -hmm. And so that was in the 20th century. So I kind of looked at this as like, okay, let's, you know, carry, not only carry that work into the 21st century, but also take into account some of the new things that have been discovered in the past century as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but like I said, when I first learned about this stuff, I went online and I ordered as many books as I can about natural vision improvement. And they were all really, really helpful. But I never really got to the end of a book and felt like, okay, I know exactly what to do and how to do it and in what order and for how much time. So that's what I want to do with my book. It's kind of like a workbook. Okay. Um, so it definitely does like go through the introduction and the anatomy and physiology mm -hmm. and, and some of those important concepts, but pretty quickly just gets into like, this is the name of the practice. This is the purpose of the practice. This is how you do this practice step by step, how Wonderful. long to do it and a little more description and pictures of it. Nice. So it, I just wanted it to be something that you could just like flip open to a random page. Uh, let see, we got one thing best, you know, so you can just open up and you can just do it and just try it out. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, a good resource um, as like a paperback or an ebook to mm -hmm. kind of guide people through the process. Right. But the documentary was a little bit more, it was a little bit less about this is, how to do it. And it was more about this is what it is. And these are some of the teachers around the world who have devoted their lives to this. Okay. So before the world shut down from COVID uh, in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, a colleague from Australia and I, Barry Ocatel, we traveled around, around the world and we were in, it was a totally like DIY kind of documentary. Um, but yeah, we, we tracked down other vision teachers like ourselves and we interviewed them and um, put it together into a, a educational film that is really meant to kind of leave you feeling like you know what this is and how it works and like inspired to take action. And, and we really wanted to put forth this like global um, community with it. Like mm -hmm. the fact that there's people in, in North America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, and there's people around the world teaching this. And we were only able to get 
we were only able to travel so much <laughs> to right. get people in, but um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's called Vision 2020 from Eyesight to Insight. Nice. And um, people can either rent it or purchase it on vision2020movie.com. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're still, it just came out the end of 2020. So we're still kind of in the process of like getting it out to the world and exploring different avenues and channels and stuff. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any suggestions or, or places of where, you know, where to put it. We've gotten some great ideas from people about maybe getting it into either some library systems or some school systems, because we really want to like get this information to the next generation um, to maybe make a difference in this like myopia epidemic that's like sweeping the world right now. So, yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. And how can people reach you? Yeah. So my main website is integral eyesight.com. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the main hub where um, you can link out to the documentary and the book and the podcast and the videos and stuff. Um, and yeah, the, you, there's my contact information on there. If people want to reach out, if they have any specific questions or want to learn more. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that's really um, my, my mission is to, is to really not only let people know this exists, but to maybe make it a little bit easier to understand and a little bit clearer path to kind of navigate um, whether you want to get some help from a teacher or you do want to kind of try doing it more solo on your own. Um, so yeah, um, or on Instagram, in Integral Eyesight. Um, people sometimes send me messages on there as well. We can chat over there too. So that's wonderful. And I do know you respond because I sent a message to you. So yeah, I know you respond. That's I wonderful. do my best. I do my best. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it's hard to keep up with, but uh, yes, yeah. I can imagine. Well, really appreciate everything you shared with us today. If you could have one takeaway that you want to make sure that people, um, you know, start to make a change on what would that be? That one thing. That's a hard one. Um, I would the, the simplest thing that I think people could do that would actually make a tangible, measurable difference that would be very low resistance, like it wouldn't take that much work, is to just, and this is actually in my book, at the very beginning of my book, I was thinking, if, if people don't read the whole book, if they just read this one page, mm -hmm. and they could at least do this, I think it would actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's the simplest, easiest thing people can do? And I ended up coming up with just close your eyes more. Okay. Like, yeah. like multiple times throughout the day. Don't just wait till you're really tired at the end of the day to close your eyes and go to sleep. Like close your eyes when you're on the computer screen. Like I said before, take a breath or just count to five or 10 and then open back up. Like do that at the top of every hour and just notice that, wow, when I close my eyes, I kind of rest. I kind of relax a little bit. Maybe my eye muscles can kind of soften because I'm not focused on anything. Mm -hmm. And then I open back up and I keep going as opposed to just going through your whole day, no awareness of how your eye taking care of your eyes. You might be staring, straining, squinting, and then it just builds up and builds up and builds up. If you just close your eyes, you know, a couple dozen times throughout the day for those relaxing breaths or relaxing breaks, you're managing your eye strain and, and you're, you're actually preventing it from coming up more in the future too. So might sound kind of overly simple, but um, sometimes that's what we need. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all this. And thank you for taking the time on a Saturday to join us and share with the audience. We really appreciate it, Nathan. It's my pleasure. It's been a, been a great Saturday to spend with you, Amy, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you today. And, uh, and yeah, I would also just invite people to check out your episode because I had a lot of fun, not only doing it, but then editing it and uh, getting some good <laughs> feedback from it already. So thank you. Wonderful. I appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today for the weekend wellness hour. We will see you again next weekend. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye.